Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Bellato. Yesterday we did a live mailbag. Thank you so much to those who donated to our cause and, you know, paid through the super chat to get a question answered or say something. And either way, you can just look at that, or at least I do, as a donation to our cause and for all the hard work we're doing. I appreciate you guys recognizing that, and we appreciate you guys doing that. So, Thank you. But today is going to be mailbag for those who didn't uh, join the super chat or join the live show. It's going to be questions that were sent into us. We have limited time because we are also recording right after this, a preview pod for the Bills Giants. But we're going to get as many as we can. So with that said, Nick, let's get right into it. Mikey Glover asks, if Ant for as long as Andrew Thomas can't go, why not give Ellen Evan Neal a shot at left tackle? That position is what garnered uh, that the position that garnered his high draft, according to Mikey Glover. Because he's not comprehending how to play right tackle and switching up a offensive lineman's footwork can really screw with their game. And I know he showed versatility at Alabama playing multiple positions, including on the inside early in his career as a member of the Crimson Tide. But doing that to him right now would not do him any justice. He needs to just master the right tackle position first. Yeah, and he's been practicing right tackle now for two years. So you would kind of get rid of all of that progress he's made. Yes, he may have had better film on the left side at Alabama than on the right side, but What's the real point of playing him at left tackle for now when Andrew Thomas is your left tackle of the future? You just paid him. You just extended him. There's no real point long term to play a Neal there. And right now, the thought process should be for the Giants, both short and long term. So overall, we got to keep Evan Neal at right tackle for at least now. Let's move on to this next question here from Chris, no longer in St. Pete. He says, if you could give Brian Dable and Mike Kafka some truth serum. Who do you think they would tell you they're missing more to run their offense for fu- or to create a functioning offense? Andrew Thomas or Saquon Barkley? I think they would say Andrew Thomas. I think you need that bedrock on the left side of the line. Right now, Daniel Jones' internal clock is so screwed up because the guy's getting hit from the blind side several times. We know this team loves Saquon Barkley, rightfully so, but to me, it has to be Andrew Thomas. I would agree. I think with Andrew Thomas in the game, you can do things like shift protection away from Thomas, leave him on an island, and know that he's going to win. You cannot do that with Josh Zudu. The opposite is almost true. And with that, you are losing resources that can either be running routes or just blocking straight. Like you're losing the idea of winning blocks (laughs) because Josh Zudu hasn't done the best job of winning blocks on an island. Even with help, he's struggled. So I would say it's Andrew Thomas. Nick and I are big believers that Andrew Thomas is, quite frankly, probably the most important player on the Giants. I agree. And this one's for me from Carrick. Nick, two questions. I would like to know what you think is the cause of our offensive line issues. Does it boil down to lack of talent, lack of execution, or is it coaching? I want to get your opinion on this, obviously, too, Dan. Also, do you see any changes in the coaching staff coming? I don't think the Giants are going to make in-season coaching staff changes unless maybe something crazy happens and there's some comments that rub Brian Dable and John Mara the wrong way. I don't think they're going to fire Bobby Johnson midseason. At least that's not where I'm at quite yet. Right now, I believe it's a lack of talent. The injuries to Andrew Thomas and John Michael Schmitz forcing a guard into the center position. And I also just think the risks that Joe Shane took really came back to bite him in the ass. The risk was you don't have a true backup center. You're going to rely on Ben Bredesen. You're going to cross train your interior offensive lineman to play multiple positions. And you're going to try to trust this guard at left tackle. Those were both risks, calculated risks, that have both come back and bit Joe Shane and the New York Giants in the ass. This is the reality of the situation. You can point blame at Joe Shane. He deserves that blame. But he couldn't predict that those injuries would happen, and they were trying to strike upside on on versatile players, and right now it's just not working. Yeah, I would say the root cause of all the O-line issues, if that's the question, I'd like to know your cause of the O-line issues. I would say it's just injuries, to be honest with you. I mean, you could say it's development, but... Brian Dable said it best the other day. He was describing the Bills offense, talking about Josh Allen, talking about the weapons. And then he said their offensive line is intact. I thought that was an interesting response from him. And that's the difference between the Giants and some of these other teams. Their line is not intact. And that has led to all these issues in my mind. It's the biggest reason. Now, as far as, you know, even if they were all there like week one before the injuries when they weren't executing, I would say development should be considered. And I don't think it's a Bobby Johnson issue as much as a, so few of these offensive line coaches are doing, you know, they don't have a lot of resources to work with. They don't have two a days in practice anymore. They have brief 
were, you know, brief time spent with these linemen during OTAs where they're barely doing anything. Even in a lot of these training camp practices, there's no hitting, there's no live pads. There's no, like, it's like blow the whistle dead when the pass rusher gets anywhere near the quarterback. It's tough to develop as an offensive lineman these days. And I think that's part of the problem as well. As far as coaches, to the changing staff are, uh, go, I think you look back at the last time it happened on the offensive line and it had more to do with a hey, falling out between the offensive line coach, Mark Colombo and the head coach, Joe judge than anything else. doesn't sound like Bobby Johnson is anywhere close to having a falling out with Brian Dable. So I don't think an offensive line change coach, uh, coach change is coming. I don't think a special teams change is coming either with Thomas McGahee. So I would say it's unlikely unless they really start to spiral. How do you continue to watch tape of a struggling team so much already knowing the outcome of the game that has to be very tedious it's got to be way more fun when the tape is good versus bad this is from d new 15 and d new 15 you're 100 right it's just our job to watch this tape dan and i unfortunately are very used to doing this because the giants have sucked the last half decade and that's when dan and i really started doing this together we had one season last year of really good tape other than that has been pretty abysmal yeah nick did a good job of answering that in political fashion I'll be a little less political. It does suck to watch bad tape. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. It becomes tedious. It becomes something that you don't look forward to versus the good tape like last year, that Vikings game, all these other games, the Colts game. That was fun. I wanted to watch the tape. I was looking forward to it. There were so many positive things to focus on. Now it's scraping and digging for any kind of positive with this kind of film. It's not fun. It's what we have to do. And eventually we're going to look to find ways to look for, you know, long-term outcomes from the tape rather than short-term right now. We're not at that point yet. The season is still quite frankly possible to fight back for a wild card. You just never know. I think Art Stapleton brought it up this week. He mentioned the lions were one in five last year and almost made the playoffs. Um, you can't look at that and just compare it to the giants, but you can look at it as a possibility. So let's hope that tape starts to get better. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope. Always gritty, never pretty asks. I'm a firm believer that it starts from the top question. Okay. How did do you feel about Joe Shane letting two captains in 2022, Nick Gates and Julian Love, go? And do you feel more or equal attention should have been given to the offensive line than the receiver room? Good questions. I'll start by saying on the captain front, I don't know. I don't know. I'll say as far as the players go, I don't think the Giants made too many mistakes there. Uh, Julian Love hasn't been great with Seattle. I wasn't a huge fan of him. I don't think he's a big re his loss is a big reason the Giants are struggling right now. Gates is an interesting one because the Giants obviously went for the youth movement there and didn't want to kind of like stymie their development in a sense, especially on paper as it looked before all the injuries. But Right now, the Giants could really use a Nick Gates on this offensive yes. line at guard or at center. The same goes for Feliciano. So it just didn't work out. And the good question, your last one, Mark, they're all good questions, but I really like your last one. You know, we brought in all these receivers. We had really good depth, the Giants. They had to cut Colin Johnson, who signed with a practice squad recently. I think when healthy, he can still play in the NFL. Cole Beasley's not playing. Jameson Crowder, I thought, had some talent. I know he hasn't been scooped, I don't think, yet, um, or at least to a starting Crowder's roster. Crowder's on Washington. Yeah, he's on Washington. Is he is he on their 53 man roster? Yes. Okay. So something I didn't know. And quite frankly, I'm not too worried about that. But the point of being, he is a good talent. That was the point of it. Maybe if they'd done something similar with the offensive line, it would be better, Mark. But the problem is, like, that doesn't work like that. There isn't a Crowder and a Beasley in free agency. There isn't a Colin Johnson even on the offensive line. Talked about this yesterday a lot, but the offensive line is a massive issue around the NFL right now. It's at an all time low from a talent standpoint. There just aren't a bunch of swings you can make, in my opinion, on the offensive line. And I think that's the big issue here. And Nick Gates also got a three-year, $16.5 million deal. Yeah, and Love got that's a big deal, too. Liam asks, if we value process over results, why, has, why was so much conceded to Daniel Jones in the contract negotiations? If he was at, if he, he said he was average at best last season. Games versus the top teams alone show where he truly was, even last season. Had they finished nine and eight and missed the playoffs, do you think he gets that $40 million per year? I don't think he gets the 40 million. I think the playoff win really kind of drove it home, but you saw so much progress with a 25 year old who has the desired work ethic of an NFL quarterback and the requisite athletic ability to allow the offense that Brian Dable, and Mike Kafka constructed last year to function. So they looked at that and then what other option do you have? I think Daniel Jones just had a ton of leverage, similar only not to the extent of Joe Flacco after the Ravens won the Super Bowl. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, Joe Flacco's out of town. 
he goes on a run, he wins a Super Bowl, and the Baltimore Ravens gave him this massive contract that probably a lot of them would say was a little bit too much, and maybe he didn't deserve outside of that Super Bowl run. So I just think he struck while the iron was hot. The fifth-year option, declining that before, ended up being uh, another huge reason as to why he's making $40 million a year right now. And I believe that's more than likely just the case. It's just the stars aligned for Daniel Jones, and he capitalized everything lined up for the Giants. They weren't injured on the offensive side of the football, and they were successful against the AFC South, and they were able to win a playoff game. So it was just the timing of it really worked out for Daniel Jones. Yeah, trying to answer both of these, Liam, I would say from the process over results standpoint, I don't think it was a results-based decision to resign Daniel Jones. I think it was a projection the Giants made. They projected that he would become a better quarterback in year two of the system if they can get him some weapons and keep the offensive line intact and hopefully slightly improve along the offensive line. There was reason to believe all three of those things could happen. None of them have happened so far, but at the time there was good reason I thought to believe that, which is why you know, I understand process wise why they would resign a player, as Nick said, 25 years old, physical talent for sure, work ethic for sure. Now, as far as results go, those results haven't been great. The offensive line is not intact. Jones hasn't taken the step forward we want to as a passer. But I think that's looking at the results of this year. And if you look at just the process, they were making a projection. Now, to answer your second question, if they finish nine and eight and miss the playoffs, do you think he gets the 40 million? That's probably a no. I think the market is what drove the 40, the contract, to be honest. And the Giants were kind of hamstrung in these contract negotiations. I felt like, you know, they came up with this number early. Jones decided, he said, we're not selling for less than 40 mil. And what were the Giants going to do? Let him walk. If they franchise tag him, they wouldn't have had any cap space to sign all of the players they did this offseason. They wouldn't have had cap space to trade for Waller. They wouldn't have had cap space to sign Okereke because his cap hit would have been the franchise tag rather than the $17 million they've negotiated it down to this year. Now, of course, some people are unaware that this cap hit this year affects future years, but it's not like the Giants snapped their fingers and did a magic trick. The reason his cap hit is so low this year is because it's going to be even larger in future years. They paid the pipe, you know, they, pre they played for this year on the Jones contract. But I think it would have been less. I think the market would have been different for Jones if he not had that playoff win. And and especially if, the, let's say, the playoff win was like 13 to 10 Giants and Jones struggled the whole game, but the defense carried them through, he wouldn't have got that contract either, I don't think. Danny Dimes, 813, asks, do you think we are overjudging Jones on how he's playing with Thomas out? I feel all offseason, the one X factor who couldn't get hurt was AT. DJ looked good all camp. Firstly, Camp is camp. This is different. You're going up against live defenses who are throwing a bunch of different curveballs at you. And secondly, I don't necessarily know who we is. I guess that's the collective New York Giants. We've been critical of Jones in the past for the limitations that he has within his game. On this podcast, we have brought up the fact that he doesn't challenge every part of the football field. That was evident on last year's tape when Andrew Thomas was healthy. The Giants were dead last last year in explosive plays. So I think that's another fair question as well. They were just able to mount a good enough offense with the assets that they did have. Now they improve the assets and the offensive line isn't there. And I get it. He's not in the best position, Dan, but the Giants, again, were dead last in explosive plays last year. It's not like they were lobbing the ball all over the yard. It was nickel and diming defenses getting into field goal range and then relying on excellent efficiency, which we know is very fluky season in and season out. And also a play action passing attack that was efficient. Yeah, you nailed all of that. I would say it's a good lesson for us to not overrate training camp. I think a lot of people who haven't been to training camp, and, and maybe for those of you who have, you can attest to this, don't really understand it fully. They just see camp and camp highlights, and this guy's 12 of 14 with two touchdowns, or this guy's 13 of 14 with four touchdowns. But you, those who have been there at camp, and I've been there as an onlooker and just in you know ongoing, and then I covered camp in 2018 with 24-7 sports. You can see how different it looks than, say, the tape when you're watching the Seattle Seahawks on Monday Night Football and doing all the things they did from a blitzing standpoint. Or the tape when you're watching Miami or Dallas against the Giants. It's a lot different. It is nothing like the same thing. It's not even the same sport in reality. In camp, Wink Martindale's not scheming to stop. He did it maybe the first offseason. They threw a bunch of things at him. But even then, it's not the same. It's not live. It's not real. It's fake in my mind the way it's perceived. It's real in the sense that you got to do it. You got to get the nomenclature down. You got to get the timing down. You got to rep it out for the regular season, but it's fake in the sense that people overinflate the importance of it um, both ways. Cause last year, two years ago, like I said, Daniel Jones had such a bad camp and then had a career year. So just keep that in mind. 
when will we see Justin Pugh in the lineup? This is from AJ Serino. What we see this week? Great Guga Muga. The great Guga Muga. I didn't even want to try to pronounce that, so I just went with the real name. But the great Guga Muga is so much better than AJ Serino. No offense to your name there, AJ. But I wouldn't be shocked to see him this week. I don't know if the Giants want to put him out there, but let's look at what the Giants did last week. They elevated two of their practice squad players were offensive linemen. Justin Pugh can offer a ton more than Jalen Mayfield and Jalen Thomas. But is he ready yet? He's got Torres ACL last year around this time. Do the Giants feel like he is in shape to play? That remains to be seen, but I wouldn't be shocked to see him this week against Buffalo. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they might be forced to play him earlier than they than they want to, but I have a weird feeling he's going to be more competent than people think. Like, Not that people think, people expecting competence, but just then like it makes sense for, for someone who was claimed, brought yeah. into the team, and then immediately has to play. Like That's how unplayable some of these linemen are that are playing for the Giants right now. I think that's a really good call, and the great Guga Muga also asks, why is the defense giving up so many points? Is Wink's play calling the reason? I think it's a lot of factors. The great Guga Muga, Dan, it's the fact that the offense is so inefficient. The defense is out there playing a lot. And I know the Giants offense recently has controlled the clock, quote unquote, and won the and won the um won the turn or well, they won the turnover battle against Miami, but they won the battle of the clock. But dude, in the beginning of the game, they're they're going three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out. And the Giants are just completely overmatched on that side. And I think the new f- are on the offensive side of the football, that's puts a mo- much more of a burden on the defensive side of the football and the new faces, I think also hurt. I'm not holding Wink Martindale accountable for the current state of the New York giants and the tire fire that they are. I don't believe that's fair to Wink Martindale. And, um, I, the, the one play with the Tyree kill against Trey Hawkins. Yeah, that, that was probably, a uh, very risky call. I'm imagining they believe that the Miami Dolphins were going to run slants and in-breaking routes. It's something that Mike McDaniel runs often. They didn't. They took advantage of Trey Hawkins at third. You can blame that on Martindale, but he's far from the primary issue with this team right now. Yeah, I think I would ask you to just consider how many points are a fault of the offense. Jones threw a 100-yard pick six in against the Seahawks. He also fumbled inside his own 10. That was easy touchdown. That 14 points to me belongs none to the defense. I guess you can blame them for giving up the touchdown, but all the special teams errors, man, like special teams touchdown. They've allowed another pick six a pick right before half that led to points. Uh, Jones, I think has six interceptions this year and, and a few fumbles lost one or two fumbles lost. And so that's eight turnovers right there. Seven, eight turnovers. Some of them, which went for touchdown. Some of them, which just led to easy fields and touchdowns, a lot of three and outs, the least funk, the worst functioning offense in the NFL right now. So what happens? Well, the defense is in a tough spot, in my opinion. So, yeah, Wink's play calling hasn't been great at times. Nick broke down probably his worst play call of the year. But I think the biggest blame belongs to the offense by far. Absolutely. Clay asks, appreciate you both for grinding all this film for us. Football laymans, we'd be lost with it. Thank you so much for the kind words. So from all the Evan Neal tape that you've watched this year and from last, from what you can see, can a move to guard even work? Like, do we think he can be a league average guard? I think we haven't seen that yet. We saw good guard tape at Alabama that suggests he can operate in that uh, in that arena. I'll say this, though. I've seen people on Twitter focus on, hey, he has bad leverage problems and people get in his chest. I think that can still be exploited in the guard arena, but he doesn't have to worry about the speed. Framing the blocks and losing to his outside has been his biggest issue. And committing his hips too early when he has to protect that edge has been his biggest issue. And I think the mental side of that has really hindered who he can be. So moving him inside, theoretically, the power that he gets on those double teams and how he operates as a run blocker, I think he'd be solid in that area. And I just think you remove one of the biggest vulnerabilities that he currently has, and that's just protecting his edge. Having a center and a tackle on each side of him will help him from a mental standpoint and also help mask the fact that he has slow feet too. So I can see him being a league average guard, but we'll have to wait and see. And hopefully we don't even get there. Hopefully he continues to take steps in the right direction. We saw little glimmers of it last week, but it wasn't nearly enough. And then you turn on that last drive, Dan, and whew, that was rough. Yeah, I would say that the main reason to think that it could happen is that he's done it already at Alabama one. Two, he loses badly now to speed rushes. That would be negated to some extent on the interior on the offensive line playing next to a right tackle, playing next to a center. So those would be the reasons to think it could work. Casey Hust asks, I know you haven't done much draft prep yet, but given what you know right now, 
how high of a pick would the Giants need to have to make you seriously consider drafting quarterback, even with Jones's contract as it currently is? I would draft a quarterback. I mean, whatever, wherever they are, if one of those top guys fall to them, that's where I would draft them. And I have not done nearly enough draft research on this quarterback class. I've heard the Washington's kids, the Washington kids name get thrown in there. I've heard Bo Nix. I don't know like where he is. I, I remember him at Auburn and now he's killing it at Oregon. Obviously, Caleb Williams and Drake May, if the Giants are selecting one or two, both of those guys intrigue me, but I haven't sat there and grinded to the all 22 yet. So it's me kind of just giving a broadcast view of what I perceive those players to be. But yeah, I think if you have a shot at one of those, you know, generational quarterbacks, you have to take it even with Jones's contract. And then you just figure it out. You could suck for a year. You could eat it. Jones could be the the senior guy. And then you transition this young kid in. But if you have a chance at a quarterback, man, you you take the kick at the can. I know Dan has that opinion. Yeah, I mean, look, Casey, I'm not going to get into specifics on the prospects yet because I haven't obviously watched enough of the tape at all. But just from a 30,000 foot view, and yes, that's my first 30,000 foot view reference. But there you go. from that 30,000 foot view, I'm not opposed to drafting a quarterback when you already have a quarterback under contract. I'm actually of the belief that I'm not opposed to drafting a quarterback when you think you might have a quarterback, even on his rookie deal. I believe quarterback is the most important position by far. It's not really a belief, it's a true fact. People are going to say, but what about this? No, no, no. No, no, no. Tom Brady. Patrick Mahomes, look at the most, look at all the Super Bowls basically won in the last 15 years. It's like the same two people with the exception of a few other guys. You go back even further, just add Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning, and you're almost done. You got a few more to add in between those times. You know, there's very few. And then if you even don't look at just the Super Bowl wins, you look at the contenders, the people who are in NFC and AFC championship games year after year after year. It's Mahomes, it's Burrow, it's Josh Allen. It's the guys that take this game to the next level at that position. So if I think I have a chance to get one of those guys, I don't care what I have on my roster unless I have one of those guys already. That's the only time I'm not considering it. Even if Jones had, had improved to some extent this year, no, I mean, that's probably stupid to say, but like if they, if he improved, the Giants will be winning games. So if Giants aren't winning football games and Jones is the quarterback, then at any time I'm okay taking it. And if I have Jones's contract for 47 million cap hit next year and a nine point whatever million cap hit for the co rookie quarterback, I'm okay to accept that knowing that I'm going to get rid of that Jones contract in a year, in the year after. And I'm going to move on and I'm going to have a cheap contract at quarterback versus Jones's inflated deal that was backloaded to these next two or three years. Casey also asks if the Giants decide to sell at the deadline, which players are available and what do you think the Giants could get for them? So players are available. Gonna... Yep, go ahead. No, I was going to say we, we touched on the players available, but what will we get for them is a, is a different is a different part of this question. I think Adore Jackson, Paris Campbell, I'm not sure who's going to want him, Xavier McKinney, Saquon Barkley, or Williams. Those are the five players that come to mind for me. Do you want to add anybody into that, Dan? No, those are the those are the big names. You said Adore Jackson, right? Yes. Okay, so, so the what first would, thing I'll say, what would the Giants you know, get? That, yeah. First thing I'll say to this is, you never get as much as you think you're going to get. You just never do. I remember when Damon Harrison went for a chance to trade him for a fifth round pick. Everyone's like, he's still one of the best D tackles in the NFL. Doesn't matter. Their contracts are expiring. They're older players. You don't have that much leverage. You're never getting that much for them. So, what could they get for these players? The best they could get, in my opinion, would probably be Saquon Barkley. And I don't think they would get more than a fourth round pick for Saquon Barkley in the middle of a season on an expiring contract. The rest, you're looking at fourth, fifths, and sixth round picks. That's the range of picks you're looking at um, with the idea in mind that you're not going to resign them anyway. So you might as well take a draft pick, especially, you know, the Giants, not amazing, but they did find Daniel Bellinger in the fourth round. And if not for injury this year, I think he'd be even, you know, people would be even higher on him. And I think he's going to have a really bright future with the Giants still. I do too. You cut out for a lot of that on my end. Okay. So I didn't get to hear it, but I think the, I don't know if you said this, so I might be redundant here. The best case scenario you might get is Saquon Barkley for a two and a four. If you want to go down that path, do you think someone would give a one, maybe a, a no. contending team? No, no, no. My, my, my thing is I don't think you're getting more than a fourth for Saquon Barkley in the middle of a season impending free agency personally, unless yeah, a team. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you so did get that, two twos and that's from McCaffrey, best. Nick. You did get two twos from McCaffrey, so maybe that's a you know not the best prediction by me. But I just felt like the situation was a lot different with McCaffrey in so many different ways. It was. I'm wondering if a team like Miami, say the Achan injury is, right. is more serious, and then Mostert has had his fair share of injury issues, as has Jeff Wilson. I could see a team like that maybe 
giving the Giants yeah, something a little bit more, something like yeah. that. But again, this is like a rental. This that has to be a, all chips in. You see a poker reference from Nick Filato there. Mark it down. All chips in type of situation from that team. Yeah, and that, that's the best bet. Barkley would be their best bet to get a three or a two. The rest are all day three. Everybody or late. else is probably yeah day three picks yeah. and stuff. Even McKinney. Yep. Renee asks, is next? Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're cutting out like crazy here. So Dan and I could be talking up. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties in the shitty Internet. Renee asks, is next offseason a reload or rebuild? Also would love to know how you guys become giant fans. How long? Thanks. Yeah. So reload or rebuild uh, reload. It's always reload for me. I don't really believe in rebuild. I think there's always pieces on a roster that should be kept. There, there at least there should be. Um, even Dave Gettleman left the Giants with pieces that should be kept. Dexter Lawrence, Andrew Thomas, among others, uh, but mainly those two. So I would say that. And then how did I become a Giants fan? Well, my dad was a diehard Giants fan. His dad was a diehard Giants fan. My mom was a diehard Giants fan. His dad, her mom, sorry, her dad was a diehard Giants fan. My mom's dad had season tickets, so I was going to games from a really early age. My dad is a fanatic, super diehard fan like us. So, you know. There was yelling and crying in the house at an early age about the New York Giants and their outcome of games. So through my father, I became a diehard fan. How about you, Nick? Through my dad, I became a diehard fan. And I agree with the rebuild assessment that you laid out as well. I was indoctrinated into the New York Giant cult at a very young age. I told this story on the podcast before. My dad was big into like baseball cards and things of that nature. And he took me to the mall one time and a nice store manager of a baseball card store gave me a Dallas Cowboys bear just because I was a cute like four or five year old kid. He's like, oh, here's a teddy bear. And I recognized the star on this bear. And I looked at it and I looked at the owner and I said, ew, Dallas. And I threw it back at him. And my dad was so proud of the fact that I did that, Dan. And he still talks about it. He's like, hey, Nick, remember that time you did that thing? And I know what he's talking about. You know, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's all he has. You know what he's say, talking about. Remember that how time? He says, yeah, he's, uh, remember all the, the time, time you did that thing. All yeah, right. he's very vague and if he if he's listening to this he's gonna shred me but <laughs> <laughs> well and i only know just just to shout out right now just to be upfront about this uh i only know that because nick's the one who said that to me so just in case you are listening that's on nick not on me he's the one who said my dad always does that hey you remember that thing thing okay <laughs> Dave Blake, yes what's the tipping point for it's time to move evan neal to guard i'm gonna get a lot of evan neal to guard situation or questions here I think it has to be after the season. I don't know if you want to try to do that mid-season unless it becomes untenable. I wouldn't say Evan Neal is untenable. That tackle right now is just very, very bad. But if it continues to be very, very bad through this season, I don't know if you move the guard. But say it is very, very bad through this season, Dan. And then the Giants opt to fire Bobby Johnson and bring in another offensive line coach. I would want to give Evan Neal another shot at playing tackle. And again, I don't know if how much of the blame should be ascribed to Bobby Johnson for Evan Neal's struggles, but wouldn't you want to give Evan Neal another shot at tackle if there is another coach in his ear? I mean, I would personally. Yeah, there's still the, there's still such a shorter long-term ceiling if you move Evan Neal to guard. So I would say unless worst case scenario is you move him to guard and unless you would need, I would say give him a full season more. Like don't, don't do it until the next off season at the earliest personally. And we have uh, another Evan Neal question from Bob. Bob Middleman, your Evan Neal Miami take was kind of positive. Psy 56 from BBI was pretty negative and Bobby Skinner was in between. How do you reconcile the different judgments about his performance from all of you outstanding assessors? Well, thank you so much for the kind comments. Look, Evan Neal's tape from that last drive and the fact that he blew a 5-0 call or he just didn't hear a 5-0 call that led to Daniel Jones almost getting decapitated, it looked rough. But the positivity that came from this podcast was more so of the fact that he had a lot of good reps in that game too. Yeah, it's a good question, Bob. And I would say that our, our assessments of Anil are probably closer than it seems because I, if I'm not mistaken, I remember I'm gonna start with Cy David, obviously David Cyberson has been on the show multiple times, friend of the show. If I remember from, and I did read his, his review. And if I remember his whole thing that really pissed him off was that he felt like Evan Neal quit at the end of that game. And I can totally see, where he's coming from there. And I think mostly he was probably just gassed and he'd been pass protecting for too many snaps, which excuse or no excuse. I don't know if it's fair to give that as an excuse, but if you're grading and gauging that as a real big problem, like why would, you know, 
someone quit in, uh, in in a sense looks like he quit in the game that's bad for the men from just a mental standpoint and from a physical standpoint i can get that and he deserves to be criticized for that and his last drive was horrible and he didn't have he had some bad moments you know one that nick brought up in between the good stuff too but i think like it just looked different to me. And I know Nick agreed. Like that was one of the first things we taught. We always do the film review separately. And then before we record, we say, no, what did you, what did you see this? Did you see that? And we both kind of felt like it just looked a little better with Neil. And I think you guys saw that too. in some of the film clips we put up, up on our page. And if you just watch the game or watch any of the all 22, is it perfect yet? No. Again, he quit potentially in the last drive or just was awful in the last drive. Either way, it's not good. He had that horrible rep that Nick said where he didn't hear the call, right. And let the, free rusher through but you know outside of those plays and a few others there were good moments too yeah we tried to well <laughs> some of the bad plays that we showed he actually looked solid in but maybe i should have done a cut up of just some of those good plays that we're referring to ksixi great follow on twitter everyone go and follow him awesome to interact with him asks with or without saquon why not at least more pony personnel to help establish some sort of run game I think part of it is that defenses are less focused on your pony personnel if Saquon Park is on a game. But I will say to a greater point here, KSIXI, and shout out again, great Twitter follow. I do feel like to some degree, Nick, the Giants have altered things that they want to do based on their personnel and injuries. I'm not so sure that's great. Like I've talked a lot about how I think a big reason the season's spiraling on offense is that they're not under center that often anymore. And, and most of what they've been able to generate in the deep passing plane has been off play action from under center. And so if you're under center with the pony personnel in there, you're running breed in motion, you have Eric Gray in the backfield, maybe it can work, but at least in the very least, it could potentially set up some shots in the passing game. So I think some of what they've done here in my mind on offense has been get away too fast from what could potentially work. But I think, generally speaking, the pony personnel is not going to be as effective without Saquon in the game. Or Andrew Thomas to help block things up. He also asked, talked a lot about scheming up free releases for Jalen Hyatt. Why haven't we seen more three-by-one sets for tunnel screens with Wandale and Jalen? Something you think can be successful with how insane we're giving up interior pressure, more trap runs. They kind of have attempted to scheme up the Wandale part of that. Not the Hyatt part with the tunnel screens and the bubbles they just haven't been successful because it's usually one player screwing up like the Isaiah Hodgins failed to block. That could have went for like 15 yards if Isaiah Hodgins executes one block. But another aspect to how defenses are playing the New York Giants is when they anticipate that tunnel screen and they see it develop and they're driving aggressively down on it because they're all told the Giants don't attack anything deep. They can't attack anything deep right now. So you're going to drive down on anything. And that's one reason why we also saw a successful, almost successful play if Darren Waller hauls in that nice pass from Daniel Jones on the hitch and go in the red zone because so many of these defenses are driving down. It was just a nice individual play by Xavier Howard. So I just think how the defenses are playing the Giants in the current state of the New York Giants, all those quick type of passes, they're not successful even though they're trying to run them and it looks like they're not running them. I would like to see more stuff to Jalen Hyatt, end arounds and things of that nature. That's something hopefully we could see this week against the Buffalo Bills. So to your point, I agree with you there. But in terms of Wandale, They've been trying. It just hasn't been successful. And it was successful a little bit, though, in the beginning of um, not the Miami game, but the uh, game previous, the Seattle game. They, they had some uh, some off-tackle plays with Wondell Robinson that went for a first down on that first drive. So we've seen a little bit of it, but not as much as we probably like. Yeah, I mean, big issue here. It's a good question, but a big issue here is when your entire opposing defensive backs and defense is just eyes on the quarterback, eyes on the line of scrimmage, drive down, because we don't give a crap about any, you know, the deep half, the field side. It's hard to run screens. I will say this. I've been wondering why there weren't any middle screens, Nick. I feel like a middle screen could potentially work when you have these defensive lines playing so aggressively, slanting and running twists and stunts up front. I think a middle screen might have a shot. I've been wondering why we haven't run any middle screen, either to a tight end or to a running back. Screens need hoping. timing, too. They do need timing. and That's, that's, that's another issue yeah. is the Giants sucked when they had all their offensive line healthy at screens and now you have a bunch of backups in there the timing is going to be a little jacked up yeah and you don't really get a chance to practice it too much you can practice it in practice but again it's not real game all right he also asks if Lel Collins is signed would you start him at guard or tackle and on which side longitudinal question when are you guys starting your draft prep shows 
probably not till after the season, but Dan and I will be more well-versed with the prospects by that time. I don't think we're probably going to be doing much draft content in season, but Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. In terms of Lyle Collins, I don't know if he would sign with the Giants if he's going to play guard, so you would need to play him at left tackle, and I think that's only if Andrew Thomas's hamstring injury is a lot worse than Giant fans want it to be. Yeah, I think Nick nailed that, and if they did sign him to play tackle until Thomas is back... Then once Thomas is back, I'd probably kick him inside the guard. But, you know, maybe he just stands up as competition for Evan Neal, and that could potentially bring out the best in Evan Neal, though I don't think motivation is what's holding back Evan Neal right now. Unless it's the last drive of last game. <laughs> yeah, and I think he was Big, just honestly just shot energy. While yeah, he, he might have been. Big Jones energy. If someone asks, if someone could get Dave Gettleman on your podcast, would you feature him and ask some questions regarding the roster? It would be an off season bag, of course. And do you, Nick, have seen or heard anything about cornerback Aaron Robinson? He was on the pup, but I, I thought that's only a four week thing. I'm honestly not certain what's going on with Aaron Robinson at the moment. That's a name that we have all just kind of overlooked and forgotten about. But with Dave Gettleman, that would be amazing we would be completely fair to you dave we wouldn't bash you we would ask you some challenging questions but i'm sure you had a process to some of the decisions that you made we would love to have mr gettleman on the podcast yeah start with aaron robinson i think one thing to consider here is when the injury happened i remember reading about how it was much worse than people realized it was a very bad injury that he suffered so just keep that in mind why that could be taking so long yeah we'd love to have dave on the podcast of course we would we would have him on if someone could get him on. I don't know if you have, you're asking because you have a connection to Dave, Big Jones Energy, but if you do, reach out to me. I'd love to get Dave on the show. And yeah, we're not going to just have a gotcha show, but we also aren't going to just praise the guy and suck up to him. We've been harsh on him. I've been harsh on him. And, you know, I'll leave that aside and I'll do my best, obviously. And that's not just do my best. I will not, you know, badger him or trap him or look to, you know, to, to put him in a tough position. But I will also ask him some tough questions about decisions he made and you know where they're at right now. Yeah, I think that would be so much fun. Kurt, love Kurt. How you doing, Kurt? He asks, would you trade Saquon for a third? And then he shouts out Justin Pennick. Would yeah, we maybe. trade Saquon for a third round pick? I think if the season continues to wane and Joe Shane has no desire to sign him to a Jonathan Taylor type contract, which I would imagine that's what he's looking for at this point, then yes, you want to try to get as much value as you can for him. It's not a great look. He could ball out on another team, be like, why'd you trade him for a third? But if he's not in your long-term plans, get as much as you can for him. And if he hits the open market, signs whatever deal, you would get a compensatory third if he balls out and lives up to that contract. And, and um, that's another way you could look at it. But yeah, I would, I would take the third. Yeah, if they lose this game to the Bills and then they lose the next week and they're at one and six, I'll take a third for Saquon Barkley. I don't think he's probably in the Giants' long-term plans. I don't know if he should be in the Giants' long-term plans, given he's injured again. I know it's bad luck, but it's the position. It's not all just luck. It's the position he plays. He's entering an age range where this position tends to fall off from an effectiveness standpoint. For years, people used Derrick Henry as a good example. Well, Henry, one of the biggest physical freaks I've ever seen, has made it far, but even now he is kind of waning off in his effectiveness, and they're mixing in Tajay Spears a lot over there in Tennessee. So... I would do the trade Saquon for a third if the Giants fall out of playoff contention. Yes. This one's for you from Timmy K. Ignoring what's right in front of our faces for a second. Injuries, underperformance, coaching, and all. At a macro level or at a 30,000-foot view level, where in the unseasoned chicken does this team actually go from here? I'd like my football team to be good at football, but how? Yeah, it's a good question. How do they get good at football from here? Answering it short term, Timmy, they have to get healthy. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Like, they don't, they can't afford to have an in, not intact offensive line. They have to get Andrew Thomas back. They have to get Saquon Barkley back. That's the start. The second part is they have to get more out of this defensive front. That means Aziz has to stay on the field. Kayvon has to be more dominant. Leonard Williams has to take advantage of the fact that Dexter Lawrence is double teamed a lot. So that's where I start for getting better in the short term. In the long term, I think we know what they have to do. They have to fix the offensive line. That's first and foremost. Some would argue they have to get better at quarterback, but they certainly have to fix the offensive line. That would be the, first, the fastest way for them to get good at football again. And let's put things into perspective real quick. The Giants have a drive with their best offensive player on the football field. A drive. 
They have a game, two games with their second best offensive player on the football field in Saquon Barkley. But Andrew Thomas got hurt after that. That was arguably, other than the, the second half of the Arizona game, their best drive of the season was that first drive that resulted in a blocked field goal for a touchdown against Dallas. So this team has been struggling. Everyone struggles with injuries, but we're starting to see how invaluable Andrew Thomas is to this offense. And I think just that's compounded by the JMS injury and putting a guard into set protections and all the other stuff that Dan and I have talked about for weeks. Rob Allen asks, what is your honest assessment of Joe Shane? His drafts haven't showed big potential yet, and the offensive line has regressed, but he's also done some good things. The 2022 Giants are better than I would have ever expected, and the year two Giants are worse than I would have ever expected when he took over. I'm look, I, I think the we had this understanding that Joe Shane was amazing, right? Like he he the the free agents that he brought in last year, all of that, like a lot of things struck gold. All the moves that he made struck gold. Now we're starting to see that regress a little bit. Regress to the mean, maybe you'd say. I'm not down on Joe Shane. I don't want Joe Shane fired. But I think I'm taking a step back and I'm reevaluating everything right now because all the decisions that he made heading into the season, none of them are working out. You can make excuses for them. I think some of those excuses are valid, sure. But still, at the end of the day, they're not working out. We need to start seeing some development from that first class as well. So I've definitely kind of um, the, the honeymoon phase that extended probably longer than it usually does. That has worn off, and now we're starting to look at every move he's made and been like, hmm, I'm not sure if this one's going to work out. We're starting to be much more critical, in my opinion, rightfully so. That's a good question, and I think that's a good answer by you, Nick. I think the big factor is let's take a look at the drafts in a few more, you know, a year or two more at least, give it some time. But I want to reiterate something about what Joe Shane took over from Dave Gettleman. Dave Gettleman left him basically nothing. Yeah, Andrew Thomas is here. Yeah, Dexter Lawrence is here. From a depth standpoint, he left him nothing. From an offensive line standpoint, he left him nothing but Andrew Thomas. From a defensive line standpoint, he had some bloated contracts like Leonard Williams. He gave him Dexter Lawrence. He left him nothing else. I mean, Aziz Ojolari was never on the field. Not a single linebacker did Dave leave him. Corners, I guess Adoree Jackson, if you count that. The rest, he had to do on his own. Safeties, I guess Xavier McKinney, if you count that. And Xavier's a fine football player for the Giants. He hasn't been that amazing. Total burned roster draft picks, Kadarius Tony, DeAndre Baker, Will Hernandez, all of those. Receiver-wise, what did he really leave him? Darius Slayton, he had to trade for Darren Waller. He had to draft Jalen Hyatt. Running back, he left him Saquon Barkley. Great. Saquon Barkley's been hurt, and it's still only a running back. So there just wasn't a lot left. There wasn't a lot for him to work with. In addition to all that, Dave left him one of the worst salary cap situations in the NFL. Tons of deferred money. Contracts that were horrible. Logan Ryan, a joke of a contract at the time that I was on the few. I'm not even going to go down that route, but I still just pissing me off that deal. He was 30 years old, made zero sense. All leadership. Yeah, great. They won six games down the stretch against trash teams with Joe Judge. Like just stupid shit like that. And so he really wasn't working with a lot in my mind. And he had to really retool this thing. It happened fast for the Giants last year. They won a lot of games fast unexpectedly. And so. The bar was set higher because of that with Joe Shane. And I get that. That's human nature. But if we really take a step back and think of how little Dave left him and the bad salary cap situation he left him in, then the really only thing I want to judge Joe Shane on is the offensive line, one, which has regressed, like you said, and two, the draft picks. The draft picks I want more time on. And the line, I think injuries are playing a big factor there. I think Joe Shane arrived in the building and said this. Incompetence surrounds me. (laughs) That's exactly uh... Austin Powers? I believe that is from Austin Powers. I'm not sure. I only have a select few quotes in here. I got to upload more and figure. I might ask Adam Azer where he got all of his uh, downloads from. They're more difficult to find. Mike Rose now asks, if we are one in seven at the deadline, do you see a fire sale? Which impending free agent could fetch more than a six round or pick swap? I would guess Saquon McKinney Adore. We already touched on, on this one quite a bit. Mike? just about 10, 15 minutes ago. So do you have anything to add to that? No, I would say same. Just, just listen back 10, 15 minutes ago. Sergio Rodriguez asks, if you were the general manager of the Giants, ooh, what would be your game plan to salvage this team for 2023? And what would you like to get out of the 2024 draft? Look, if the Sergio, if the Giants lose against the Bills, I don't know what you're going to salvage. We've talked a lot about injuries. It sounds like an excuse. I just think it's a sad reality. I would just start adopting a future mindset. 
and look to fire sale some of these players after Buffalo loss, depending on what happens with Daniel Jones's health, seeing what happens with Washington. And then 2024 drafts still a little bit early, but I want some damn foundational pieces and some good football players. <laughs> Yeah, I think you you said it best there, Nick. I don't have too many thoughts yet on the 2024 draft. We want to watch the tape on that and get a better feel. As far as 2023 goes, game plan to salvage it, get healthy, and win games. Like I, I don't know what else they can do at this point. Exactly. Sir King Bowman asks, how much better would the Giants' outlook be if they had just tagged Jones and let Barkley walk? Did winning a playoff game make management commit the sin of thinking this team was closer to competing than it was? compromising for a rebuild same sin made by prior regimes look this is a fair question sir king bowman and it's fair to consider and it's unfair by people who would listen to this question and get angry at him for asking this question and that's what seems to me to be like a lot of the problems in the world and on giants twitter like people don't even allow the entertainment of questions and you know it is fair to wonder would this team be in a better outlook moving forward if Daniel Jones was on the franchise tag right now and Saquon Barkley wasn't on the roster. And in that scenario, they'd probably be trending toward, I don't think they would have won against the Cardinals without Barkley. So they probably would have been, they would have been 0 and five. And I think they probably would have been Jones is hurt. He might not be playing any for an extended period. We don't know about that. Andrew Thomas sounds like he's not playing for a while. Given the setback, they could be staring down the barrel of a top, two or three pick even more likely if they didn't have Barkley. And then in that scenario, the Gi Giants would have had just Daniel Jones on a franchise tag and they would have had zero cap space committed to him next year, not the 47 million with the 68 or whatever it is guaranteed, like the amount of dead cap pushed back to next year where he's stuck on the roster. In that scenario, you would draft a quarterback, you'd re-sign Tyrod or find someone like a Tyrod to bridge him in the quarterback, but you probably let the quarterback play right away, like Stroud has, like Young has, like Richardson has, so that's the way to go, in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of sitting him for a year. I personally don't believe in that, but it's hard to argue they wouldn't be <laughs> potentially in a better spot, but the argument that they wouldn't be would be. Nick, that was a lot of wouldn't be would be. The argument would be that Daniel Jones is still 25. Daniel Jones has flashed signs of progress. Daniel Jones has won them a playoff game. He scored a lot in the playoff game. He played really well in that playoff game. Um, and you'd be giving that up. You'd be giving up that prospect to take a gamble on another type of quarterback prospect, which could set the team back to some degree. There's a part of me, Dan, that is, um, I like the fact that this regime came in and said, no, we're not going to pick up Daniel Jones's fifth year option. And then they said, okay, we might have been wrong about that. And they didn't get take lock. And then they actually signed him. I don't like that's independent of the contract and what's going on right now. But just the fact that I believe this general manager is, is flexible and fluid and he's not a rigid thinker is something that is always sticking in the back of my mind when I'm evaluating Joe Shane. What are your thoughts on that? It's a great thought by you, I think. And it's a great. On the surface, Nick, I like the idea of that, like a, a flexible general manager, the opposite of Dave Gettleman, who was incredibly rigid. My one question is, though, like, is that what happened? I guess would be my question. If that's how it played out, Nick, I like it. If they played out like we might be wrong on Daniel Jones, I like it. If it played out like, shit, this dude just took us to the playoffs. He won a playoff game. What message does this send if we just let him walk? The owner loves him, really wants to resign him. Let's just do it and make it a deal that we can get out of in time. It's not as good. I don't view it as highly. You know, you know what I mean? I, if they genuinely I do, believe, I do. yeah, it's, it's here's the thing with Daniel Jones last year. Like it's tough to really gauge how much progress he made. There were definitely signs of progress as far as his pocket management went and his pocket presence went, but there weren't really all the things that we talk about. There weren't really yeah. examples of hole shots. There weren't really examples of field side throws. There weren't really examples of, him doing, you know, processing and throwing with anticipation. There was a lot of schemed up production by the coaches and there wasn't a lot of production. We just thought there was like, you'd always brought this up. They're dead last in explosive pass plays. They didn't really move the ball that well through the air. So like, it just comes down to if they were convinced he was actually improving and they're like, yo, yeah, we might've got this wrong on Jones. Let's resign him. Or if they felt the pressure of the playoff win. I think that's an excellent point. Jeff asks, Jeff Finero asks, why doesn't Bobby Johnson come under more scrutiny for how poorly the offensive line seems to have developed and prepared? There are a number of examples around the league of injured units that compete. Also, Nick, try LMNT 
in your water. Way better for you than me. Oh, thanks for looking out for my health, Jeff. I actually really do appreciate that. And I'll look into it. And I think Bobby Johnson is under a ton of scrutiny right now. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with it, Jeff. I, I see a lot of people coming at him. A lot of people are coming at him. A lot of fans are coming at him. I don't know if we've been that critical of him, Nick. So maybe it's a question for us. But I'll just lean on what we've okay. said before and we'll say again. Nick and I are not offensive line coaches. We've never been offensive line coaches, and we don't know any offensive line coaches that have worked in the NFL. With that in mind, we don't have an idea of what they're responsible for, what their day-to-day is, what their week-to-week is, what their year-to-year is, and month-to-month is. We don't know what impact these guys are actually having on what we see on the football field. Having said that, there are good examples of the OGs like Dante Skarnecchia and Mike Munchak and Bill Gallahan, who seem to just get the most out of whoever the hell they're coaching up on the offensive line. So obviously it has to be worth something, even though Nick and I can't really tangibly qualify it, or we have no real, nothing to work off of. We know it's worth something. So yeah, maybe he does deserve more criticism. It's just hard for us to specifically criticize someone when we don't really know the ins and outs of what they're doing especially when we have discussed the macro issues with the situation of having a non-traditional backup center and a guard play tackle. Like it's not a great situation and I'm not sticking up for Bobby Johnson either. We've been clear on this podcast. The development is something that we can criticize him for because none of these young offensive linemen have developed. Lucas Mansour asks, how good is Thomas McGahey? Really? This man has outlived two head coaches already. (laughs) <laughs> my uh, my father would say he, he must have naked pictures of Mara or something like that. That's what my dad yeah. would say. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know. Again, I'm not a special teams coach, but our special teams unit have sucked for quite a while. I think he had one really good season per EPA on special teams. But yeah, no, I, I really do not understand what's going on with the special teams. Tom Quinn, it was a similar thing. He just was there forever, and the special teams sucked when he was there as well, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't, I just don't really have a good answer for this one. What about you? No one will ever be as bad as Tom Quinn was from an effectiveness standpoint on the Giants special teams, even if T-Mac, you think he's in that range. Trust me, he's not as bad as, as Quinn was. But as far as like how he's outlived multiple coaches, it's so odd. Like You referenced that one season by DVOA. Giants – Special teams was like elite top 10. I think they were seventh overall. I was so hopeful after that year that we finally figured it out on special teams. And it's just been such regression since with McGay's units. I don't know what makes him good. I, uh, you know, as Nick said, I have trouble evaluating special teams, but as far as how he's outlived these coaches goes, I don't know, Nick, I think maybe he's just somebody who works hard and they blame other things for the special teams mishaps. And I completely understand why the fan base is upset with Thomas McGahey because it's it's yeah. gotten to a point where I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, you need to start blaming somebody. All right, we have a question from Tobias Colmenga. If we sign Lyle Collins, what would the ideal starting offensive line be, assuming everyone is healthy? So assuming everyone is healthy, the ideal offensive line, I think it would be Andrew Thomas and then Ben Bredesen, John Michael Schmitz, Lyle Collins, Evan Neal with Evan Neal on notice and Lyle Collins possibly earning that right tackle spot. But I don't think Lyle Collins signs here if he has other offers to strictly just play guard. I think he would have to have a shot at tackle. Agreed. I don't think he's signing to play guard. So I think if they sign Lyle Collins, they'd have him in until Andrew Thomas is back, which seems to be a long time. Then honestly, Nick, like Lyle Collins is what, 30 years old, I think I saw (laughs) with good tape. Like I don't hate the idea of Signing Lyle Collins long-term, it's so hard to find offensive linemen if the workout looks good and if the film then starts to look good during his time replacing Andrew Thomas. Like, think about this idea. He comes in, they sign with the Giants for the one-year deal. He replaces Andrew Thomas until Thomas is back. That could be as long as four or five more games. He looks good there. Then he says, you know, I played, came here to play tackle. They move him to right tackle. They put Evan Neal inside at right guard, maybe. He plays well there. I don't mind the idea of re-signing him and giving up on Neal at that point because at that point, yeah, you were hoping Neil could be a 15-year starter, but it doesn't look like he's going to be. And at least you have a chance to get a three, four, five more year starter out of Lel Collins. He can play till 34 or 35. He's a good technical offensive lineman. Then you could potentially get something more out of Neil. It's just something I'm open to. I'm not saying that's the way I would do it, but I do think what Nick says is really important here. He's not signing to be a guard. I don't think he is either. But Dan, I have a quick question actually just off the top of my head. Presuming health without Lyle Collins, what is the ideal offensive line right now? In your opinion, let's say Thomas left tackle, Justin Peel left, Justin Pugh left guard, center John Michael Schmitz, right tackle Evan Neal, 
right guard Ben Bredesen. That's mine as well. Um, you could you could talk about Justin Pugh being right guard or Ben Bredesen being like that's interchangeable right now. But I think Justin Pugh is certainly in that rotation, which says a lot about the state of this offensive line. Giants just picked this guy off the practice squad, but watching his tape from last year, I went through it, man. It's actually really not that bad. He's much more athletic than I expected him to be at 33 years old. Yeah, and he said it today. I thought it was funny. Justin Pugh, an interview with Giants Media, said something like, yeah, look at the average age of our offensive line. He's like, I think it's 23, between 23 and 25 years old. I think it was 25 years old he came to. He said 23 and 25. That's how young this Giants offensive line is. And he's like, yeah, I am the veteran. And he's like, these offensive line look at me, and they didn't even think I was an offensive lineman because I'm not that I'm not as big as them. And he isn't like a huge, bulky offensive line with a massive chest and, you know, huge upper, upper body. He's more of like the, like you said, rely on technique, rely on uh, foot speed and athleticism, which he still has, I think, at 33 years old. So I almost wonder if maybe I, I should flip that and say left guard Ben Bredesen, right guard Justin Pugh, just so he could help out Evan Neal more. It's a good point, man. They need they need a lot of help there. Just pick up a damn twist, okay? Like it's not you got to be a little bit more aggressive when you're transitioning with these twists, right? You can't just allow them to just go right into the B gap. You got to jump them a little bit more. You got to deter that and and lead to a transition. It's just both sides of the line aren't doing that right now, and that's another Bobby Johnson um, indictment, I guess. Sir King Bowman asks, should the Giants trade their 2024 third round pick for an IDL and make sure first that he's an impending free agent? <laughs> yes, that's a great recipe for success there, Sir King Bowman. And I absolutely love the question and the not so subtle dig. <laughs> yeah, maybe just make sure. The only thing I would add, Sir King Bowman, is make sure you're out of playoff contention mathematically <laughs> before you trade your future picks for players. Uh, oh, don't worry. The Giants are almost there right now. <laughs> They're working their way there. Jeff Hillenmeyer asks, why is the status of Thomas basically day to day, but he has been out for weeks? Why can't we find out what's actually happening with him and others? I <laughs> looked in these uh coaches, they they love playing games with the media and just not they're not like saying, Oh, I'm gonna f the media, they're not like coming out and saying that, but they're just saying, Yeah, he's he's day to day right now, and that's just how they're gonna list him. I think the Giants actually know how severe this injury is, they didn't want to put him on IR, so I think that setback that pre presumably happened last week probably did happen. And um, it's just something that a game that I think coaches play to give themselves a slight edge over their upcoming opponents. I don't know how effective it is though. Yeah. I think Nick nailed that. That's been something Brian Dable's done his entire coaching tenure. Pascal asks, I think it's just Pascal, Pascal, bud. It can sometimes be Pascal actually when it's running. Oh. It. Yep, yep. It can sometimes be Pascal. I think don't quote me on that, but Pascal, let us know. It probably is Pascal. But his first name is David, I believe. It's David Pascal, so it might be Pascal. There are oh, Pascal. I thought this was a first name. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. And there are potentially first name Pascalis. Actually, there probably aren't. It's all Pascal. So I was wrong on that. Don't have, you know, I shouldn't be you questioning you. You capitulated very quickly there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal <laughs> asks, what's your favorite sports movie? It could be any sport. Oh, that is so tough. Dan, do you have one that just jumps to your mind? Yes. I have so many. Okay, uh, let's hear yours. I have yours. so many. You're right. But one has always been my favorite by far, and that is Remember the Titans. Remember the Titans to me is the perfect sports movie. I would even argue it's the perfect movie. It pulls at the heartstrings. There's football. There's life. There's segre there, you know, there's issues with race. It's just awesome freaking movie. I love and it, the star player gets paralyzed in a hospital. Like Ugh. just so many great heart pull on your heartstrings moments. So it's always going to be Remember the Titans for me. Remember the Titans is certainly up there for me. I like Friday Night Lights is a very good football right. movie. <laughs> Happy Gilmore. I know it's a uh, it's more of a comedic movie, but it, you can never go wrong with that. Like you have iconic characters in Happy Gilmore. Like Shooter McGavin, who almost wasn't cast for that. He denied that role. And then he went golfing. And you're going to love this as a golfer. He went golfing. Adam Sandler wanted that specific actor for the role. The actor denied it. Went golfing. He was like, I had a good day golfing. You know, maybe I'll do that golf movie. Called Adam Sandler up, got that <laughs> part. That is his iconic role as an actor. I don't want to say made his career, but everyone looks at him. He's like, ah, oh, Shooter McGavin. He still does the shooter thing. Has a whole Twitter about it. Yeah. Man. Isn't that nuts? So Happy Gilmore is um, a silly movie that also qualifies for me. That's awesome. I never knew that story. All right. Tom Corbisario asked, what's your lowest point as a Giants fan summed up in a single play? <laughs> Thanks for the great content. I enjoy the podcast more than the games. Thank you, Tom. It's a great question. Do you have one? Because I have one that comes to mind. Yes, I have one, unfortunately, Tom. My um, lowest point 
was the 2000, I think it was in January 5th, 2003, the 2002 season, if I am not mistaken, the Giants are playing the San Francisco 49ers. I am at my friend Ulrich Gray's birthday party. I'm not even a teenager yet. I'm like 12 years old. I'm going crazy in front of the TV. The Giants take some sort of astronomical lead. I think they're up like 38 to 14, absolutely beating the crap out of the San Francisco 49ers. San Francisco 49ers come back in the second half, win the football game. And I guess the lowest point would be that missed field goal at the end that the Giants had a chance to win. And Richie Soybert was down the field and ended up stumbling. And there was a, I think there was some kind of call that wasn't made that could have went the yeah, Giants. Way, but, interference, they should have called yeah. it. The Giants should have never allowed the San Francisco 49ers to get back in a position to win that damn football game. And I was freaking out in front of the television. All the parents were like, what the hell is wrong with the Falato boy just going crazy in front of the TV right now? <laughs> that would have been my lowest point as a New York Giants fan. I was thinking about this question when I just read it. Like the Deshaun Jackson oh, punt gosh. return. Like, is that the lowest moment because it cost the Giants division that year? Maybe. But to me, the lowest point is not, cannot come from a year where the Giants are like contending or even in a playoff game, like you mentioned. To me, the lowest point is the third and nine from 2020 or what was it, 2021, when Joe Judge just ran the victory formation or what was it called? The, uh, the third and nine where he did, what was the, what's the name of that formation? It's called the Tush Push. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is called the tush push. For Joe John ra ran the tush push. He was innovative. What can we say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> on third and nine, just giving up on the play, giving up on the series, giving up on the season, giving up on, you know, hope for Giants fans. They could watch it, come to the, come to the, you know, have a tough week of work or have a normal week of work. Either way, prepare for Sunday to watch a fun game. Football. It's a fun game. We're supposed to watch stuff that makes us happy plays even in a loss season. That's not fun. That's not happy. That's shit. That's total utter shit from Joe judge. And so obviously, you know, yeah, there you go. So that to me was the lowest moment. It was embarrassing. Everyone made Does fun it of smell us. good enough for you in there. It went over Twitter, uh, social media, just a total of everyone's laughing at the giants. So was, that would be my bad. lowest moment. It was bad. We only have time for one more question. Unfortunately, and oh, it man, comes there's from like three more pages. I know. I'm sorry, everybody. Sal in Queens asks, would you mind commenting on this question? Duke Mannyweather kindly answered for me this morning, specifically in what you are seeing on film for the Giants. Here's the question for Duke. Have a question. I hope you can answer. How much is an individual offensive lineman's performance on any given play affected by what the quarterback reads pre-snap and calls at the line? Is it a large effect or not that impactful? Thanks in advance. And this is what Duke Mannyweather, who is an offensive line guru, if anybody does not know, this is what he said. Great question. And it really depends. Some schemes quarterback will call protection, the alert, and the kill all at the line of scrimmage. Pre-snap, which means mental processing and understanding of the offense is vital. In addition, offensive linemen typically have their calls and adjustments, so communication is vital. Everyone has to be on the same page and get the call. Dan, this is stuff that we talk about all the time. I'm glad Duke answered it in this manner because the Giants have this musical chairs at the offensive line position, and the person that's being tasked to make the calls was a rookie center, which is precarious enough, but a smart one. Now he's not there. Now you have Ben Bredesen in, and you see all of these protection mishaps, and you see these unblocked defenders coming in. So that's one reason why I believe there's so much instability up there. It's not just the fact that these guys average an age of 25 years old and they're and they're uh, young developing players who probably shouldn't be starting for an NFL football team, a lot of them. But it's also, none of these guys have many snaps together against competition at all. And when you're going up against really skilled defensive coordinators, they can scheme against your protection because they more than likely know that they're going to get an advantage while also dropping seven in coverage because they could do that with four with simulated pressures and creepers, which is unfortunately something that we've seen. Yeah, I think Nick nailed that. And I think the big thing is what Duke said about communication. It's so important there. You have to be communicating uh, at all times. And you have to understand what that communication means post-snap. QB can play a big role in it. We don't know the role it's going to play. But I think, that, Nick, you did a great job answering that. So I'm going to lean on your answer there. All right, awesome. All right, that's all the time for we have today. Unfortunately, we're jumping on a preview podcast in two minutes, though that's going to probably come before this one, which is coming after. So this is almost like going back in time or forward into the future. All right, Nick, it's that time of the week. It's the prize picks time of the week. That's prize picks, prizepicks.com backslash banter. That's go to prizepicks.com 
backslash banner. Use the banner code. You'll get free money. They'll match your deposit up to $100. These are fun. I love this style of plays. I love this style of fantasy, whatever you want to call it, because I like picking props, Nick, and I think props are fun. I like how they do it. So you can get a three parlayed prop, 20 to win 100 or five to win 20. But you could also do what you always do, Nick, the coward way, as I call it, which is I the- call it the coward way. Don't steal my my term. I'm a coward and I can admit when I'm a coward, Dan. You're the only one who could call yourself a coward. So that's fine. The, uh, yeah, you know, the less risky way, but. Prize picks, prizepicks.com backslash banner. Go check it out. And this week's an interesting one, Nick, because of the injuries with the Giants as we record today on Thursday, which is deep into the week. But yet, despite it being deep in the week, we have no idea who's playing quarterback for the Giants. Daniel Jones didn't practice, but he says he wants to play and expects to play. Or at least he did say that at one point. Prize picks has reflected that uncertainty by not listing Daniel Jones or Tyrod Taylor props. Also, Saquon Barkley thought maybe he'd come back this week. Now we're thinking maybe he won't. Trending toward the probably wrong direction, but still possible. He's not listed either. So we're not working with as much on the Giants side of the ball. We are working with more on the Bills side. They don't have many injuries in the offense side of the ball. At least they're peppered on defense with injuries. So I got my prize picks. It's a little interesting this week, Nick. I'm going to go uh, with a few plays that I don't normally go. A few players I may not normally go from a position standpoint. Do you want me to get into mine first? Do you want to pivot and give yours? Nah, you can go, bro. You're on a roll right now. I'm on a roll. I'm going to start here, Nick. Josh Allen, more than 295 combined pass and rushing yards. I just think, look, Tua threw for over 300 last week, didn't need to run. Josh Allen will run. This is just going to be a game where I think they're going to have the ball a lot, the Bills offense. It has to be a get-right game for them because, as you know, we discussed with Eric Turner, People are calling for Ken Dorsey's head. Maybe that's not realistic and they shouldn't be, but people wanted more offense against the Jaguars. They felt like the Bills slept walk through parts of that game. So it feels very get righty for the Bills against this Giants defense. So just to get to 300, just 295 and a half. I mean, I think Josh Allen will definitely get to 300 plus yards total. So I like that one a lot more than there. I have Josh Allen less than 0.5 interception. Look, the Giants got their first interceptions of the week of the season last week against the Dolphins. One was a really good read by Bobby O'Karake to a through a dumb ball there. What'd you say? They both were really good reads. By they Bobby both were O'Karake. really good reads by Bobby O'Karake. Not to say he can't do that against Josh Allen, but Josh Allen doesn't really throw that often into that range of the field. And I just think it's going to be a little bit different this week. And I'm going to rely on the numbers and the stats and the trends and the trends say the Giants only had an interception in one of, and I know they had two in that game. But they only had an interception one of their five games this year. So this feels like the best, probably, probably the best pick on the board to me. And then finally, with very few to choose from on the Giants side, I'll go with Graham Gano less than five kicking points. It's not much to get to for Graham, but I'm also just not so certain the Giants are going to score points in this game or many points in this game. And in that sense, Nick, if they do fall behind early, the Giants, Nick, they could get to a point in this game late quarter two, early or late three, and then all of quarter four, where they're down by so much that they can't really settle for field goals and they have to go for it on fourth down instead of field goals. So that's why I feel like it's a smarter play, even though it seems on the surface like, oh, it's five points for Graham Gano. He could get to that. He should get to that. You know, thir- if the Giants score 13 points, that's two Gano field goals. I lose this one. But there's also scenarios where the Giants get behind early and they have to go for it on fourth downs. Then you're not even attempting field goals. Uh, and it's going to be even harder to get to those points unless the Giants are scoring a lot of garbage touchdowns. And right now, the Giants aren't even a team that can score in garbage time. When they get to garbage time, the offense still isn't delivering points. So less than for me on Graham Gano. Let's flip it over to me, and I'll start right there with Graham Gano. I'm going more than everything you said makes sense. But I look at the New York Giants in the fourth quarter getting blown out by the Miami mm-hmm. Dolphins. And what were they doing? They were kicking some field goals there. And all you need is a 50-plus yard field goal from Graham Gano, and then you cover it. So I'm going to trust that fact that the New York Giants, look, their offense is anemic. I'm predicting them to get six points. That would be two field goals, but I can also see them scoring a touchdown and then going for two, which in this case I would lose. But I think the current state of this offense is they will take points when they can get them. They've also come up with solid opening scripts in several of the last games that we have seen putting Graham Gano in position to kick field goals. Now he missed one last week, I believe it was. He missed one against Dallas, the block. And I think he also missed one as well. But Graham Gano is Mr. Automatic. All he needs is a 50-plus yarder. So I actually have more than, although I do 
trust your logic as well. I think it's just what exactly happens uh, in the game. It's going to the New York Giants, man. I hate my prediction for this game. I really do. I really hope I am wrong. Yeah. Josh Allen, more than 265 passing yards. He has achieved this in three out of five games this season. It's Sunday night football. I think Bills want to show off. I think Ken Dorsey wants to show off a little bit against his former yeah. superior in Brian Dable. And the New York Giants, they can be susceptible to the explosive play. And Josh Allen is a very talented player. So I'm going more than on 265. And I'm also going more than half a touchdown for Stefan Diggs, rushing, passing, receiving. I think he receives a touchdown. Look, I fully understand if nobody wants to make that um, or go with that take just because Stefan Diggs touchdown. Yeah, that's likely, but touchdowns are a little fluky. It could go to Gabe Davis. It could go to a tight end. But again, Sunday night football, Stefan Diggs is a better wide receiver than any of the cornerbacks the New York Giants have. So I'm going to go more than there. All right. Those are our prize picks for the week. Remember, go to prizepicks.com backslash banner. You'll get your hundred dollar deposit matched immediately. Make sure you put in that code. Otherwise, have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.